people have spoken they took action and something happened for them praise the name of the Lord come on praise the name of the Lord this month to the glory of God we're gonna be looking at a topic and it is my prayer that it's gonna change us gonna do great things for us our topic for this month is understanding the covenant of marriage we're gonna be going through this in our Sundays on, on Fridays we're gonna be looking at it understanding the covenant of marriage what was the intended plan of God for marriage what do we say in marriages now what should marriage look like it's important anything that deviates from the laws of God will never prosper and that's why we need to be very careful if this kingdom it has to be by him not by you if it is by you you will only struggle if it is by him grace will be at work for you praise the name of the Lord now I have a statistics on marriage that I want us to look at before I go into the word media can you please help me with it let's look at the statistics now this study was taken us at the last uh, late December 2016 it says according to the Associate Press and Journal of Marital and Family Therapy 41% of marriages one or both spouses admit to infidelity either physical or emotional second one says 57 percent of men admit to committing infidelity in any relationship they've had the third one says 22 percent of married men have strayed at least once during their married lives the next one 14 percent of married women have strayed at least once in their married lives 36% of men and women admit to having an affair with a co-worker. Wow. 35% of men and women admit to infidelity on business trips. 17% of men and women admit to infidelity with their brother-in-law or sister-in-law. Average length of an affair, two years. The next one, please. 74% of men would have an affair if they knew they would get they would never get caught 74 68 percent of women said they will have an affair if they would ever get caught 79 percent of respondents said that having an affair with a, a taken man was never acceptable a surprising 46 percent admitted to haven't done it men who have been divorced or separated are twice as likely to cheat 28 percent versus 14 percent women who have been divorced and separated are also twice as likely to cheat 19 percent versus seven percent children of divorced parents are at least 50 percent more likely to get a divorce than those from an unbroken home when both the husband and wife come from divorced families the odds <laughs> Of divorce are 200 percent higher more than a third of divorce filing last year contained the word Facebook according to a survey by divorce online a UK based legal services firm and the last one the American Academy of marital matrimonial lawyers say 81 percent of its members have used a face evidence plug from Facebook Twitter and other social network sites including youtube and linkedin over the last five years 66 percent of the lawyers surveyed cited facebook forms as the source of online evidence one in five adults use facebook for flirting and affairs are most likely to occur two years into a marriage praise the name of the lord now these are statistics and i love statistics I love statistics I love statistics because even the Bible tells us about statistics the word covenant has statistics in the Bible and God wants us to know the essence of marriage because it's not what we see it was not God's intended purpose for marriage that we see nowadays and then so when purpose is abused the essence of creation of that thing will never be achieved and what are we saying this morning God is saying he wants us to understand the covenant of marriage marriage is not what we think it is it could be better 
if we understand the covenant of marriage there will be peace in the, in the house there will be peace in the society the world will not be the way it is today as a matter of fact statistics have shown that the why the reason why there is no rest in the world is because a lot of children are vagabonds from home nobody catered for them growing up and then so they've decided to destroy the world and these are things that God wants us to understand now the word covenant is from the Hebrew word berith and Greek word thick. now a theologian called George Pedersen defined covenant as the mutual relationship of belonging together with all the rights and duties that this relationship entails for the participant also uh, a theologian called J. Bertridge defined it as a relationship between two unequal partners a mightier one offers a relationship to the one that is not mighty meaning that in the triangle of marriage God is the one that is on top husband and wife are the ones beneath so they cannot do anything except they receive grace from the one that is on top and that is what is saying to us here now in the Old Testament alone the word covenant is found 278 times which shows its importance not 10 not 20 278 times we see the word covenant 76 times in the book of the prophets Isaiah to Malachi 76 times again we find it 25 times in the poetic book of Job Psalm and Proverbs and then in the New Testament we find it 33 times to show us the importance of covenant marriage is not a contract it's a covenant marriage is not a contract it's a covenant and we need to understand that so what is a covenant is defined by the scripture as a solemn and binding relationship which is meant to last a lifetime it's not for 10 15 20 years it's not for 50 years i was reading an article recently and uh, you know one of the foremost musicians that well respected after 52 years of being married she divorced and i said what is left for you after 52 years of being married she now divorced what is left for you in life to live after 52 years of being married with her own age probably she's about 70 or 70 plus what is left can't you just condone it what is left and we need to understand this because if we don't understand this there wouldn't be any difference between us and the world the bible says let your light so much shine that the world will see us and they will know that we belong to him we should be the one that demonstrate marriage to the world not the world to us marriage was not something that was formed by man it was formed by god god is the orchestrator of marriage now i love what jack aford said jack aford writes and said the covenant of marriage is the single most important human bond that holds all of god's work on planet together and that is true god will not do anything or interfere in this realm of the world without a family everything that god wants to do he looks for a family to do it through when god wanted to set something to send to deliver the israelite he went to the man called manoah he went to a family when god wanted to save you and i he went to the man and the woman called joseph and mary so god is not permitted and i repeat it again god is not permitted to do anything in this fair without human beings and he doesn't just look for entities he looks for families so it is no small wonder that the lord the lord that the lord is passionate about the sanctity of marriage and stability of the home this covenant of marriage is based on the covenant god has made with us it is in the power of promise of a mankind that our personal covenant of marriage can be kept against the forces that should destroy homes and real lives i want to give these two notes to us to have number one there is a sign to remember which serves as a witness and a memorial in every covenant when god struck a covenant with noah he said by this rainbow every time i see the rainbow it reminds me of the covenant that i have with you 
that I will not destroy the world with water again. And then so every covenant has a symbol. There's a witness and a memorial to every covenant. Again, we can see that in Genesis chapter 9 verse 16. Again, every time a covenant is struck, there is always a change of name. We see that in Genesis 17, 5 and 15. When God reaffirmed his covenant to Abraham, God said, No longer should your name be called Abraham, but your name shall be called Abraham. God changed the name of Abraham. And then so, it is not something that is of a mystery that we see that when we get married, we change names. Because it has always been like that from inception. Sarai was changed to Sarah. The name of Sarah changed after God enacted a covenant with who? With Abraham. Now, I'm going to read our text to us in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 and I'll read verse 22 and 23. It says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the savior of the Lord. Now, what are the covenants that we have in marriage? Number one, marriage is a covenant of three people. I told us. God, husband, and wife. There is nothing in marriage that is called threesome or foursome or fivesome. There is nothing like that. Marriage is between three people. God and the couple, husband and the wife. Anything that wants to add to that is inferior, wants to destroy the covenant. And we're going to see that in Genesis chapter 2 verse 18, verse 21 to 23. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him an helpmate. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. And he took out of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, man made he brought her unto him. Verse 23, and Adam said, this is the bone of my bone and the flesh of my flesh. Who named him, who said bone of the bone and the flesh? It was Adam, not God. Adam saw what was brought out from him and he said this is the bone of my bone and this is the flesh of my flesh so only three people were there Adam Eve and God so a covenant the covenant of marriage is only between three people number two marriage is a covenant to become one flesh the Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother shall cleave and join unto his wife and they shall be called one flesh Ephesians 5 31 talks about that as well so he said therefore shall a man and a woman cleave not man and man not woman and woman so we must understand this that the world cannot dictate to us what marriage should be we should be the one that will tell the world this is what the Bible says that marriage is all about praise the name of the Lord come on church praise the name of the Lord Come on, praise the name of the Lord. And because there is no place, because marriage brings you together through the covenant to become one flesh, there cannot be room for divorce. There is no room for divorce. May I let you know that there is no issue that can happen in marriage that cannot be resolved. It's only a wisdom issue. Wisdom. 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 I've been privileged. I've been privileged to see you know, to see couples that you would think it will never work again. And then we sat down with Daddy Gio. And by the time Daddy was done in 30 minutes, everybody put their hands on their head. And said, what? For three and a half years, there was no, no solution. But in 30 minutes, we sat down. Daddy was there. In 30 minutes. And husband and wife looked at each other. And everything just resolved. Wisdom. And so the Bible says, when we lack something in the day of adversity, it's because our strength is little. The reason why we fail in marriage is because you have to work at marriage. You must invest into it. When you don't invest into it, when challenges will come, there will be nothing for you to show for it. You must invest into your marriage. You have to. It's like you go to school. After you're being taught in the lecture room, you still go back and do your own study. It's the same thing with marriage. Not that you went through, uh, you know, you, you did uh, counseling. Oh, we've done counseling, so it's settled. 
No, there's still much to it. And we must have that in mind. Marriage is hard work. It is. And we must have that in mind. It is not for babes or for babies. It is hard work. And I always tell people, the person you marry in life will either make you or destroy your life. So you can look at the shoulders, that the shoulders are broad. You can look at the nose, that the nose is pointed. Oh, she's a beautiful, she's beautiful. She can be a beautiful witch. Handsome, handsome wizard. Can be. Don't choose with the eyes. Choose through God. Don't choose with your eyes. Choose through God. The eyes of man can, can deceive you. When Samuel got to the house of Jesse, he said, God has sent me here to anoint a king. And he saw, the Bible recorded the first Samuel chapter 12, he saw the first one. The Bible says it was good to look upon. The shoulders were broad. He said, this will be good for a king. God said, no. He looked at the second one. Ah, ah. He said, the skin is radiant. God said, no. So it's not the function of the pointed nose. It's not the function of uh, the six pack. One pack can be better than six at times. Praise the name of the Lord. Come on, praise the name of the Lord. Don't let them go and use six packs to begin to six pack you. God forbid. So let God choose for you. Let God choose for you. The eyes are deceitful. Your eyes can be deceitful to deceive you in the things of your destiny. May that not be our portion in Jesus' name. Mark chapter 10 verse 6 to 9 says, But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. And from this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, cleave unto his wife. And the twine shall be one flesh. For they, then they are no more twine, but one flesh. Verse 8 says, verse 9 says, What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Number three, the number three covenant that you will find in marriage is this. Marriage is a covenant of responsibilities responsibilities a lot of us don't understand what responsibilities are but they are responsibilities they are res huge responsibilities the man the husband must love and sacrifice it's not easy when you are still a young man by yourself you make all your money you buy all the gucci's you buy all the cars that you want to do everything you want to do yourself but now you're not married the children now come you have to deny yourself of what you want to buy. That's your responsibility. So if you're not ready for that, then don't dive into it. If you're not ready to begin to save for the school fees, don't dive into it. How many of us here that we schooled in Nigeria did our parents say, go and collect school loan? You cannot tell your children yet to go and collect school loan. You brought them to this world, you take care of them. If you save well for their future, you will not put their future into debt. So it's huge responsibility. Don't tell your children, now you're 18. Yes, yeah, you have your sin number. Go and collect your school loan. It's huge responsibility. With such things, your children will not respect you. I've had a child tell the father before, Daddy, I heard when you were in Nigeria, your dad paid for your school fees. So you finish your master's. Why are you telling him to go and collect loan? We must understand that their responsibilities. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28, 5 and 28 says, Husband, love your wives. Loving is huge responsibility. You don't love it, do we? Hey, baby, baby. Yeah, yeah. It's responsibility. It is. It is huge responsibility. Regardless of what came over you at work, you will leave work and come home and shine your face. You shine your face. So with the moment you leave work, once you get home, you leave work at the door inside your car. Once you get home, you change again. Hey, sweetie. Even your, your boss, who is younger, 10 years or 15 years younger than you, would have put hand on your nose. When you get home, your wife would know. Say, hi, sweetie. How are you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But when you get back the following day, you can harden up your face. That's your responsibility. You must love your wife and sacrifice for your family. Number two, responsibility from the husband. You must nourish your wife and sanctify her. Ephesians 5, 29 says, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourish it, feed and cherish it, and take care of it, even as the Lord did for the church. Number four, covenant that the man must understand under responsibility, you must dwell with her. 
you must dwell with her. First Peter 3, 9, 7. Likewise, your husband dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto your wife. You must honor your wife. I always tell people, every time your wife will have to ask before you give to her, you're not honorable. Yes, you're not. She stayed by herself. We started buying cards those days. Some of us, you jump the plane from Australia, you will go to uh, Africa, all because you want to show love. Now you have put ring on the hand. To give anything now becomes voila. But those days, you would buy tickets. You'll be jumping all across the world. No, you should continue. If before you used to do it twice in a year, now that you're married, do it four times a year. Yes, from glory to glory. Don't let it depreciate. Am I speaking? Am I talking? Hey, if before you would buy something, now that you're married, give your credit card. Say, so that just go, go, buy, go and buy something. Am I speaking? But I, I know, I know the, men, the men are wise too. I know the men are wise. You say, take, take it, take it. Once they go, just lock the pin code. Change the pin code. <laughs> don't do that. Too. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. You must dwell with her. And this one, this next point is very key. Apart from dwelling with her, you must know your wife. A lot of us don't know our wives or our husbands. We don't. And one of the things that I've come to understand in life is, is for you to know each other better. One of the things that helps to bond together is during, during trial, trials, trials and tribulations. Bonds husband and wives together. It does. It does. But what is it that the devil does at that time? It makes us to just tackle each other and throw tantrums at each other. It was because of you that we are in this point now. See, go and do it yourself. Bring us out again. You brought us in. Bring us out. But it's a time to bond together, to know each other. Because what? Well, the moment that one goes, I guarantee you another one is coming. Man that is born of woman has only a short time, full of trials and tribulations. Look at life. The moment you are coming out of one, another one comes. So we must know each other. And the wife, as so I close with this, what is the wife? Submission, Ephesians 5, 22 to 23. Submit yourself unto your own husband as unto the Lord. You don't command submission. You earn it. You earn it. Yes, as much as the woman is mandated to submit herself to you, not the woman that you batter or the woman you don't take care of. You don't. You must earn it. The Bible says submit. You must submit. I'm the head of this home. Hey, you are the head, but show that you are the head. Has it ever occurred to you, the head is good. When everybody wants to see the cap, they see it from the head. But let the neck refuse to move the head. Instead of turning this way, you, you see? I said, what happened? It's because the neck has refused. And that is what happens in a lot of marriages. Once the woman refuses, I tell people, when God said, he that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor. The reason why a lot of men are not rising in life, you don't understand favor. You have eyes, but you can't see. After redemption, when man fell in the garden of Eden, God cursed man. Say, until you sweat, you will not eat. But after redemption, grace came into place. So if any man, you don't want to sweat in life, just rub, you know, I always say something. How many of us have seen Aladdin? You know, Aladdin and the lamp. You know, once they rub the lamp, the genie comes out, whatever, if you want sausage, they'll give you sausage. He said, you have three wishes. Instead of you asking for money, if you like, go and ask for bread and butter, I'll give you bread and butter. I say, one wish is gone. But the moment you rub that lamp, say, genie, come out now. And the genie comes out, say, genie, take me now from Calgary to New Zealand. Boom, you appear in New Zealand. That is the favor that God has given to you. Just continue to rub it. He didn't say, slam it. No, say, rub it. The moment you are rubbing it and you are praying, God is answering. Before you answer, say, before you speak, I will answer. Before you speak, he said, I will answer. Before you speak. So God put woman in the life of a man as an embodiment of favor so that it will ease your stress in life. That will ease your stress. But when you don't know, what do you do? 
You give her identity. Pack, I will sit down there. You are slapping your favor. When favor comes out of your life, hard work and labor, favor to labor, may that not be our portion in Jesus' name. I said, may that not be our portion in Jesus' name. And then I'm going to stop on these. The last one on the covenant of responsibility for husband and wife is to train up their children. Train up your children together. Not the wife, not the husband. Do you pray? Do your children pray? Do they pray? Who is the priest of the house? It's you. If there's no prayer in your house, it's the husband's fault. Because you are the head, you are the priest of your house. If your children don't know God, it's your fault as a husband. Because you should want that, should portray them. Make them know that there's something called the altar of God. When they wake up in the morning, the first thing they should do is to pray. The first thing they should do is to pray. If your children don't know God, then I don't know what you are embodying to them that you know. I don't know what you have told your children that is the source of your inspiration or what has kept you in life. What will your testimony be if you cannot tell your children about God? If you've never told your children about who God is, to sit them together in the morning time or evening time and tell them how God has been faithful to you, how God brought you from nothing to something, how God opened doors. When the enemy said it was end for you, God said, I'm just beginning. If you don't tell them of that God that did for you, what testimonies are you giving to them? So it didn't cost God anything to take what? To take the priesthood away from Eli. Why? They refused to tell the children about God. They didn't honor God the way they should honor God. So what am I saying here? As husband and wife, part of our responsibility is to train up our children. And let's make sure we do it well. Let's pray for them. Let's make sure that our children are honorable. I said this about two weeks ago, you know, when Pastor Georgina was preaching about uh, taking action concerning our children. The evidence of your life is your children. When I want to see your life, to see how good you have lived your 70, 80, 60, 50 years thus far, I look at your children. Show me your children. I'll tell you how you have lived your life well. Now, once I was privileged once to sit you know, with my pastor, we sat and Bishop Oedeko was talking about the children. He said, he has told the children, go and do whatever you want to do. He said, the children said, Daddy, you know what? We will do everything we want to do. But we see the, the hand that is upon your life. We want it to be upon our lives. He said, what the world needs to see that we've gone to school, we will go to any length to take it. We sat down with my pastor and he was saying it like this. The children sat down. Then they were still very young. This was uh, 2005, 2006, you know. And I look at all of them now, pastoring, doing this. Why? The testimony of his life are the children. So for us as parents, let's understand this. The testimony of your life. This is my story. Your song is your, your children. What we see your children do. That is your story. So my question for you today, this morning is this. How well are you doing that? Are you training your children in the way of the Lord? Or are you allowing the teacher in the day home to train them up? Or are you allowing your living caregiver to train up your children? All because you want to do all your professional exams. May that not be our portion in Jesus' name. That when God will come calling for our children, may you not find us worthy, wanting in the name of Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. So we'll take it from here next week again. This is just laying the foundations of what God expects us to know about covenants. And may I let you know, let me close with this, that when you look at your scripture from Genesis to Revelation, there was no man that we can still recall their name today that they did excellently well that they were not in covenant with God. There was no man or woman that we're still reading about them today that they were not in covenant with God. So one of the things that covenant does, it preserves legacy. Covenant, it makes it to go beyond you. Your children's children. We talk about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We call him the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But who was it that God cut the covenant with? It was with Abraham. But now we talk about who? Isaac and Jacob. And that's why it's important for us as parents to understand what covenant means. So that when the naughtiness in us wants to come alive, 
we suppress it and say, hey, 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 don't do it. <laughs> Our children are there. They can suffer from it. You saw what we, said, what we read there? Husband and wife from a broken home said not 100, 200% likelihood that they will not succeed. 200% likelihood that their marriage might not succeed. So we need to ask ourselves, what are we living for? I pray that the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Let's rise up to our feet. Let's rise up to our feet. Let's celebrate Jesus. Let's put our hands together for the Lord. Let's put our hands together for the Lord. Let's just lift up our hands before the Lord and receive grace from him this morning. Father, let just lift up your hands. As a married person, as a mother, as a father, as a wife, as a husband, just lift up your hands and receive grace. You're trusting God for your future partner. Just lift up your hands and receive grace from him. Father, we come before you this morning, the covenant-keeping God. Father, we understand the essence of covenant that it is to bind us to you so that when you look at us, you see yourself. Father God, we come before you this morning by grace. And Father, we ask, adventure there's any family here, that the covenant of that family, of the marriage, is shaky. Father, we ask for mercy this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we speak, we speak I declare this morning peace to every raging storm in any home. And I declare that the peace of God that passeth every understanding will rest on every home represented here in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I make a demand of heaven this morning. The Bible says they go from strength to strength as they appear before you in Zion. But for every family represented here, and for those of you watching online, I declare, Father God, that as we move from here, give the husband and wife that spirit of understanding in the name of Jesus. Father, grant them the purpose of unity for one.